Okay. Thank you for bearing with us Zoom land on our uh, technical setup. Uh, I'm going to pull up my notes. So thanks everybody for being here this evening. My name is Dulce Kirsting Lark and I'm the executive director of the Latak County Historical Society based here in Moscow. We're really pleased to be offering the third program in our series, How It's Going, How It Started, which uh, is supported by the Idaho Humanities oh. Council along with, we're gonna get all sorts of computer noises. Um, it is also, uh, kind of conceived of in collaboration with faculty from the Washington State University Department of History and their Roots of Contemporary Issues course. So each of our presenters, and there's going to be five programs in total, this is number three, uh, they teach in the RCI program and they also uh, recently published a series of books based uh, on that work that uh, Oxford University Press put out. And you can find more information about that on Oxford University's website, uh, on their press website. We can also connect you with that information if you're interested in learning more. The Roots of Contemporary Issues course, for those who aren't familiar, is a, a course that all WSU freshmen take as a sort of orientation to the university, to university level work, uh, and to the use of primary sources. I had the good fortune of being a teaching assistant in that course many moons ago and have um, since that time really wanted to bring something very similar to that to a general audience through the historical society. So it seems like a, such a good fortune to be able to do that with people that I know from WSU and really enjoy working with. Uh, I do want to thank the staff here at the Kenworthy for all their help setting these programs up. As I said, we did have um, programs earlier in the fall, in September and October. You can find recordings of those on our website, um, latacountyhistoricalsociety.org. They're hosted on our YouTube page. This evening's presentation is um, presented by Dr. Ken Fonts, and I'm going to give you just a little information about Dr. Fonts, and then I'm going to turn it over to him. So uh, Dr. Ken Fonts is an associate professor in history at Washington State University and has taught a variety of courses since 2001. He was part of the design team for the Innovative Roots of Contemporary Issues program and piloted several issues in the new program. Fonts has received several teaching awards at WSU, including the Richard Law Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award in 2016, the Common Reading Excellence Award in 2014, the Martin Luther King Distinguished Service Award for Faculty in 2014, and the First Year Focus Living Communities Excellence Award in 2013. His main areas of research are 19th and 20th century US history with an emphasis on globalization. His current primary areas of research are gender studies, race and ethnicity, popular culture, and the history of drugs. He is the author of Heavy Traffic, the Global Dr Drug Trade in, history, in History's Perspective, uh, published in 2020 by Oxford University Press. That's going to be uh, the basis of his comments this evening. And if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. And at the end, I know um, Dr. Fonts is always very gracious about taking questions. So welcome. Get this, get this down. So my glasses don't keep bogging up. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And thank you for everybody out there on Zoom uh, for, there we go. Uh, for attending tonight, uh, taking time out of your evening. And so what I'm going to be talking about tonight, as the title sort of says, is uh, the historical basis uh, of the opioid epidemic today. So I'm not going to spend very much time on today. I'm not going to be looking at today uh, and or the connections to the pharmaceutical industry and those things. What I'm going to be talking about and what was going on at in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries that brings us up to today and what was going on today. But first, I want to just um, make sure this is working. Nope, it's not working. No, it is not. Okay. It's actually not changing anything. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure what the deal is with. You might just have to do this. Sorry. If you do it that way, you'll okay. sort of go down All there. Right, Sorry right. about that. Yeah, no problem. 
All right, we'll get it moving forward here. Do this. Whoops. Okay, now it's doing it. All right. Anyway, the um, I wanted to give you some statistics uh, that came out in the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes World Drug Report, uh, the 2021 edition. And so, uh, drug use. Uh, killed almost 1.2 million people in 2019 uh, that they were reporting on. Uh, and in 2020, they were reporting that 20, 275 million people in the world were using drugs. And now we're not talking about medicine, we're not talking about pharmaceutical drugs. We're talking here about what a lot of these that would be considered illicit drugs in the world today. So there's a major issue going on. Now, it has also been heightened uh, during COVID. Uh, they have seen all of these numbers go up uh, during COVID because of issues of isolation, depression, anxiety, other things that are going on as part of this. Uh, 2021, the United States report that the uh, overdose deaths uh, topped 100,000 in 2021. And this was uh, a new record setting and it's not the biggest record perhaps, but it's definitely shot way back up there. Now, not all of these overdose deaths are due to uh, opium uh, and opium products, but the majority are, the, it's the major part of it all. And so that's really all I'm gonna talk about except I'm gonna give you some statistics of the illegal drugs. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the connections with the pharmaceutical industry and issues about prescribing drugs and then taking people off of these painkillers and then they turn to illicit drugs and all of these types of things. But I do wanna recommend a book, if you're interested in this topic, a really good book to read that connects the uh, illicit drug trade, the pharmaceutical industry and addiction is this one, uh, Dreamland. Um, and so I highly recommend it that gives you a nice overview of what's going on and does a good job of looking at all the different aspects of it in a very even-handed way, I felt, that it's not picking one side or the other kind of concept. But in 2021, uh, the UN reports that illegal opium production, so focusing just on opium, so this is the illicit, not the legal opium, uh, opioids that are being produced, is that um, the number one country producing uh, opium is Afghanistan. Afghanistan produces some 80% of the world's opium, something close to that, which in 2021 equaled 6,700 metric tons of opium was produced. This is the illicit market that they're estimating. And this is an image of uh, producing opium, you know, harvesting opium in Afghanistan. Uh, it's a basically you take the poppy at a certain stage of its life, you scrape it, it oozes it, you collect the sap. Kind of idea. Now, the number two country in the world for producing illicit opium is Myanmar uh, or Burma, which produced 340 metric tons of opium. So you can see the difference that Afghanistan is still the number one. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Afghanistan with the Taliban, because in the past, the Taliban were very anti opium and anti drug. In fact, if you were caught producing opium, uh, growing uh, opium poppies, you would have your hands chopped off. But then when the war happened and they started losing to the United States, they turned into a uh, drug cartel uh, selling illegal opium in the world in order to raise money to fight. And no one's sure what's gonna happen now, <laughs> whether they're gonna continue with that, they're gonna stop it again. Um, but in the world in 2021, there were 8,400 8, metric tons of opium were produced, illicit opium. And a lot of this was turned into a 1,000 metric tons of pure heroin that was produced because heroin is the high dollar item uh, to turn it into. Some is turned into morphine, some others. There's a little bit that's smoked still, but that's actually kind of rare, um, except in Afghanistan, they are smoking it a lot more now. Um, but heroin is the high dollar item. So basically, there's a lot of opium out there, the illicit opium, and that's not even counting the legal aspects of it. And so what I wanna do now is move back to the past of how did we get here? How did we make opium so common uh, as part of all of this? And one way that I looked at this in my research was the globalization of these drugs 
and the globalization of opium. And so the aspects that made it a global commodity because opium was used before the 18th century uh, around the world. It was used as a medicine, it was used as a painkiller. And it, so it showed up in a lot of places, uh, but it was not a major problem in most of those places. It wasn't mass produced in most of those places. It just was there. Uh, but this all started to change in the 18th century and then definitely in the 19th century when it became a global commodity. And so that's what I wanna focus on. And what I wanna start with is the first aspect of looking at globalization is imperialism. Imperialism is a major part of it. And I'm going to look at several facets of uh, globalization as it regards to drugs. And so what I'm gonna focus on here is India and China as an example, because this becomes the biggest market that then spreads around the world. And so India, had some poppy, opium poppy producing areas and they were producing a little bit of opium, not that much. Then the uh, Great Britain uh, started taking over India uh, bit by bit and ruling in under imperialism. And it really gets going in 1757. Uh, and this is part of the Seven Years War. Uh, Great Britain is expanding out their overseas empire and they start moving into India. And the company that is kind of the leader in this uh, that in opium production and others is the East India Company. So the East India Company becomes a major company uh, for uh, Great Britain and for England. And their primary interest in opium has to do with tea. Um, and so tea is closely tied to the opium trade in the beginning. This Great Britain, England wanted tea and they wanted Chinese tea in particular, Chinese green tea. And the Chinese had a method of producing and harvesting green tea that no one else had. And England really wanted this. However, China did not want anything England had to trade for it. Uh, they had everything they wanted. England originally tried tobacco in China to try to selling tobacco, but China started growing their own tobacco that they preferred over English tobacco. And so that didn't work. China wanted silver, hard, uh, species. And so they decided that they had to find something in order to be able to get that tea without a major trade deficit. Uh, and they decided opium was the way to do this. And they started bringing in opium. Now, England and the East India Company was not the only one to do this. Uh, the Dutch uh, were doing this. Uh, some others uh, were doing, the Portuguese were doing a little bit of opium trading. But England and the East India Company quickly moved up to being the dominant one in this. And by 1793, uh, the East India Company had a mo monopoly on the opium trade in the Indian Territory. So they started and they, by 1793, they had taken over all of the really lucrative poppy growing areas of India as they could start growing more and more opium poppies as part of this. And so they started dominating those and the British government went along with that because a lot of money was coming into them as part of this. They then uh, started monopolizing the trade, sending it out. And while they're not the only one trading in opium by 1793, they are definitely the dominant force in the market for the global trade. Now, China is not the only market uh, for this opium, but it becomes a big market because there are a lot of people in China uh, and they want this tea as part of it all. And so I don't know if you can see that. Uh, oh, you can here, mine, I can't. Um, so, um, and so here are some opium smokers uh, in China. And so smoking opium becomes common, starts to become common in China. And at first it's the wealthy uh, doing it because it's rare and all that. And where it comes from is actually the smoking of tobacco. Uh, the Chinese started smoking tobacco they then started mixing their opium with their tobacco and smoking that. And then eventually they just got rid of the tobacco and started smoking the opium as part of itself. And so they start bringing this in. It's kind of a, a, for the privilege and the elite, but you can't make as much money that way. So they start bringing it in more and more. It gets less expensive as they flood the market. Uh, a idea circulates in China that opium will help with sexual pleasures uh, and that 
If you're high on opium, using opium, uh, sex feels better, you last longer, everything is just wonderful about sex on that. And of course, this, what this ends up being is that actually it's mostly men that use smoke opium in China. Uh, women do use it, but it, the men outnumber women at least two to one, sometimes three to one, depending on the time period. And so it starts to gain in popularity. It starts trickling down then into wealthier uh, villages, uh, then eventually down into the peasant class, uh, small villages start to do this. However, the Chinese government and the emperor doesn't like opium. And so he starts to outlaw it and ban it. He, first he bans the importation of it, then the sell and possession of it. And uh, by 1799, the Chinese government prohibits all importation, cultivation, and use of opium in China. However, that doesn't work uh, because the English are still bringing it in, mainly through the East India Company. Uh, it's already starting to work its way into the Chinese economy. And this becomes very complicated in China because while the government is saying, no, we don't want everybody to smoke opium more and more and more because they're less productive, there's addicting, addiction factors are going up, all of that. They, uh, it's a major lucrative industry. And so more and more Chinese merchants get into it to sell it locally. So the British smuggle it in, sell it to Chinese merchants who then sell it to local establishments. And so you get this whole economy starting to be based on this as it starts to spread. And so it's very hard to stop it as a result of that. Oops, there we go. And so this is uh, an image of uh, opium smoking paraphernalia, not the pipes itself. The ones with the small holes are opium bowls. Uh, the other are lamp bases to light your pipe and how to, um, do it in case you wanted to know how to smoke opium. Uh, you have a long pipe, wooden pipe or other material. If you're wealthy, you have the little bowl on it. You put a little of the opium around the hole. You light it with the lamp. You let it smolder then draw in the smoke through the pipe. Pipe's long so it cools the smoke before you get there. That's the basic premise of it, of how you're smoking it. And here are some more uh, opium smokers. The bottom is getting cut off, but they're Around. And this is what the Chinese government did not like, that basically people smoked opium, they sat around in a slight haze, uh, and they weren't productive. And so they, they wanted to stop this. And so they start putting pressure to do it. It doesn't work. Now, as I said, opium is starting to go all over Asia, and then we'll talk about the commercialization of it in the West as well. But China is a huge market. Um, it's a big chunk of market. So chests of opium were sold in auction at Calcutta. So it's still being produced. Most of it's being produced in India. It's sold in auction and then smugglers bring it in. So the East India Company itself is bringing it in. Uh, their uh, people are, but they also auction it off to smaller merchants who then smuggle it in. That way, if they're caught, and it's destroyed, the East India Company isn't out any money because they've already sold it. So it's that idea. And now a chest of opium that we're talking about here is they start to standardize this because the, it's coming in so much now. And so a chest of opium is about 60 to 65 kilograms of raw opium that's in a chest. And so that way they know what, how much they're selling. Now these chests would be smuggled in and then they're uh, broken down into smaller amounts. And this is an East India, uh, actually an East India trading ship uh, bringing in opium here, even though they weren't, the, you know, like I said, they sold it to others. And so in 1735, and so this is when it really, they start bringing it in, these chests, about 200 chests per year are brought into China. By 1796, about a thousand chests a year. And then in 1799, the Chinese government really tries to stop this whole thing because so much is coming in. By 1820, it's 4,000 chests a year are being smuggled in. And come on, there it goes. Uh, by 1850, it's 30,000 chests a year are being brought in. And so it really increases. And this is just to China. This doesn't include the other market. I'm just using China here as the example. And so, it's pouring in uh, as part of this and becoming quite common. And this is an image 
uh, in India. This is uh, a opium factory, what they called it. It's a warehouse where they would process the opium and, and put it into these balls of pure opium. Uh, these would then be loaded into the chest be equal that 60 to 65 kilograms and then loaded on the ship sold and shipped in. And so this is one of hundreds of warehouses like this that they're producing. So we're talking an immense amount of opium starts to be produced. Now, as I said, not all of it is going to China, a significant portion is, but it's also at this point starting to move around the world because there's a big demand for it uh, as part of this. Now, and so opium at this point uh, is starting to be really pushed as the wonder drug as we move into the 19th century. It's going to cure everything. They start using it to treat all kinds of things. So it's a painkiller and it's still a, uh, used as a painkiller, but they also are using it to treat anxiety, insomnia. Um, they use it to treat diarrhea because it makes you constipated. Uh, they're uh, using it for all types of what they consider mental conditions uh, that they're giving it to people. They treat depression with it, which is fascinating because opium is a depressant, um, but they're treating depression with it. And they did notice, doctors did notice that if they gave it to patients who were depressed, if they took them off opium, they became even more depressed. Uh, so. Yeah, because there were you know, problems with that. And the answer was, well, let's put them back on opium and give them more and it will be all right. And so it starts to become a, a drug used for everything here. And where it was sold on the end, so you put it into the big chest, uh, you ship it out, it's then broken out in the chest into smaller amounts and either put in metal tins, which are quite common, or these little jars like this. And that's what would be sold to individuals. Uh, is the, these little amounts that they would sell out so that you could smoke uh, either in an opium den or at home or wherever you might want to. All right, so China is getting more and more stuff. The Chinese government is that this opium is pouring in, it's becoming part of their economy. So, and so before it, it even reaches the peak in 1850, in 1838, um, a Chinese commissioner uh, over Canton decides to put a stop to this. He's ordered by the, the emperor's court to put a stop to it, he decides to. So he seizes 20,000 chests of opium uh, that was being smuggled in illegally. And he arrests the opium merchants that go along with that. He then destroys those chests of opium, throws them into the harbor, destroys them all. This really outrages the British government and the opium merchants, because this is bringing a lot of money into uh, Great Britain, by this time, that balance of trade between England and China, Great Britain and China, has really balanced out and it's going in the English favor. Uh, they're doing really well with this. And so what this leads to is what's known as the first opium war or the first Anglo-Chinese war. So all of this is imperialism. And this idea of imperialism, this more powerful Western nation comes in, is basically moving in economically to dominate this, uh, taking over the, the country. And then when that starts to get upset a little bit, they go to war and uh, defeat the Chinese. Now the Chinese lose uh, in this battle because they really are outgunned. And this is the British Navy destroying some of the Chinese fleet here uh, because England has been industrializing. They have new weapons for the industrial revolution. They have steam powered ships, long range cannons. China does not, they are non-industrial so they end up losing. And the result is, is China agrees to open five ports to the British so that they can bring in goods unobstructed. One of these ports is Hong Kong uh, and Great Britain keeps Hong Kong uh, as their possession until 1999 when they've given it back to the Chinese government. So they kept it for a long time. They limit British tariffs, the tariffs on British goods coming in. They grant rights to the British in China. And basically what this is, is that um, the British citizens in China are exempt from Chinese laws. Basically, if they break Chinese laws, the British government will deal with that individual, which is usually a slap on the wrist and nothing much more. And it, depending on the crime. And then China had to pay the cost for the war. This is another thing Great Britain does is they make the loser pay for getting beat up on. Um, and so this weakens China and the Chinese empire. 
Well, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on these because we still have a lot to talk about, but China tries to get rid of opium again a second time. And there's a lot of other economic factors that go into this, but they fight a second opium war in 1856 to 1860. They lose this one as well uh, because they're still outgunned. Nothing much has changed. And actually the Chinese government is weaker. And in this particular one, and this is a, um, this is the uh, bridge going into Beijing. Uh, and basically the Chinese army was destroyed here so that they, the government had to surrender. The um, Chinese, gave a bunch of concessions again, but the biggest one was that China was forced to legalize opium. So now op they cannot make opium illegal in China anymore, which they had been trying to do. And they had to begin massive domestic production. Uh, Great Britain and the uh, opium merchants decided shipping it from India to China. That's tra transportation costs, it takes time. It save a whole lot of money if you just produce it in China and then sell it across Asia there. The distances are shorter. So they start making them do that. And by the time you get to about 1900 as part of this, China is the major opium producer in the world producing 80% of the world's opium, uh, slightly over 80% of the world's opium. Uh, that's being shipped not only to Asia, all over Asia, but all over the world. And so they become the number one uh, producer at this point. So that's that shift that imperialism makes them do. All right, so the second part of this. So while that was going on and through the 19th century, this imperialism uh, getting it produced in areas, you also have commercialization as part of the industrial revolution. So you start massive commercialization and mass production of these products. Now in Asia, most people smoke opium. That's way you do it. But in the Western part of the world, while the people are smoking it, uh, and in some places you eat it, and eating opium is another way, uh, but it's kind of bitter, so it's not as popular in some parts of the world. The, um, in the Western part of the world, they like to drink it. Um, and so they start mixing opium into what's known as laudanum. And laudanum is a tincture of opium and alcohol. Uh, basically. So it's a mixture of opium and alcohol that's kind of concentrated. You can then put that in other products and other drinks and all of that and, and drink it and get similar effects. And so they start doing this and mass producing this. But then that's not enough uh, because opium um, does have some side effects and it is addictive. Uh, if you, you know, you're smoking it, it becomes addictive. And so they wanted a drug that would have no side effects and not be addictive at all, that they could then mass produce. And so they developed, this man developed morphine in 1805. He isolated the morphine alkaloid in opium to produce morphine. And they thought, this is our new wonder drug. It's gonna be non-addictive, it's gonna be wonderful, let's mass produce it. And that's what they start doing. And the company by 1821, it's the pharmaceutical company E. Merrick, which is still a major, it's a German pharmaceutical company, is still a major pharmaceutical company in the world, commenced production of morphine. And they start mass producing morphine and selling it out. And how they used it at first until the mid 19th century is you either smoked morphine or you drank morphine. Uh, so you mixed it in a tincture and you put it in alcohol or other drinks, or you uh, could mix it with tobacco, crystallize morphine and mix it with, with uh, tobacco and smoke it or just smoke the morphine by itself. Uh, but then in the 1860s, they start developing better hypodermic needles uh, that become uh, easier to use. And so now you can start injecting morphine. And so syringe morphine starts to become popular. And this is a big deal in the mid 19th century because you have a whole series of wars around the world where you need pain medications for the battlefields that are simple and easy to use and morphine fits that bill. So like the American Civil War, they gave an immense amount of morphine to soldiers. And as long as they had it, they gave it to them. Of course, they ran out a lot, uh, but they start doing this. And so this spreads the use of morphine, even though you could still smoke it and drink it as well. And they start using morphine for all kinds of things. And I just want to mention this, uh, everything you could use opium for, but more, because they started using morphine as a cure for alcoholism. And so they decided that if you were an alcoholic, if they gave you morphine, you were no longer an alcoholic which is true. You become eventually a morphine addict if you keep using it too much. Um, and so they do that. But then they decide, no, morphine's addictive. 
Uh, it has side effects. So let's develop something new called heroin. Um, and so in 1874, it was first synthesized by this man, T.R. Older Wright, and uh, making heroin, which stronger uh, than morphine. And the idea of how it was touted is the new wonder drug because it's a non-addictive substitute for morphine. And they said, you're worried about getting addicted on morphine, take heroin. If you're addicted to morphine, take heroin. If you're an alcoholic, take heroin. Um, and so they started really pushing heroin then as part of all of this to get it out and manufacturing it. And when I say them, I mean pharmaceutical companies, doctors, uh, medical practitioners, government officials, and that's the them. And the number one manufacturer of heroin, heroin at this time is the Bayer Company. Um, and they had, as you can see, they, they had asp Bayer aspirin, Bayer heroin. That was their big selling product. And here it is here, a little vial of it. Um, you could buy this in any store, over the counter, anywhere. And so you go down to the uh, local pharmacy, drugstore, wherever, you didn't need a prescription, just buy your little jar of Bayer heroin. Um, and so you could, like this, you could uh, smoke it, uh, you could mix it into things and drink it, or you could inject it. So you had all of these different ways in order to do it. So you spread it out more and more. So you see this massive commercialization of these drugs. And I mean massive. Advertisement is very much part of this. Take this drug, use it. It's going to help you. It'll cure everything that you have problems with. In life, it will fix it. Um, they start prescribing it in the Western part of the world, uh, in England, and especially the United States to women uh, a lot, uh, because they decide that it works really good with what they call women's problems. Um, and what are women's problems at the time? Well, anything men don't want to talk about. Um, and so mainly it was menstruation, women's menstruation. And so if women were having pain during menstruation, have some heroin, it'll fix you right up. And so they did. This also was being used as a cough suppressant. Uh, so to, because it does, it does suppress your cough because it deadens the airways and all of that. So you start doing that. So you get all these products. And so I want to talk about some of these products. And these become known as patent medicines. Now, patent medicines become huge in the 19th and into the early 20th century. Now, first of all, they're not really medicines. Uh, they call them that. And the reason they call them patented is because all of them have a secret formula that they, have, they patented uh, that, as part of it all. And patent medicines are made up a whole lot of different things. Uh, a lot of different drugs go into them, opium, and laudanum, it's basically, out, most of them have an alcohol base. And so some of them have opium and alcohol, so laudanum, uh, and that's the most common. Uh, but they also use cocaine, uh, cannabis, uh, tobacco, uh, they put into them, they use caffeine uh, into them. So there's, and all kinds of other things. Some of the nasty ones, they would use arsenic and uh, cyanide and strychnine and things, just a little bit in there to give a kick. Um, that kind of idea. And not all of them had these drugs in them, but most did. Uh, and so like these right here that you can see, so here's a whooping cough syrup. These are all opium based ones. Uh, so they've had, they're either opium, heroin, uh, sometimes morphine, laudanum, but you have the whooping cough syrup to help your whooping cough, the system vitalizer. You wanna vitalize your system. So take this and it fix you up. It's alcohol and opium. It'll fix you up that night, you feel great. Next day you don't feel so good, but that's okay, drink some more. This one's one of my favorites. Walcott's Instant Pain Annihilator. And I like it because of the ad. Uh, because what you see is the demons of pain around the edges causing back aches and neck aches and headaches and all that. And in the middle, you have Walcott's chasing off the demon of pain and the demon's standing there going, curse you Walcott's and has to flee, that kind of idea. So drink this, all your pain goes away. This is Ayers Cherry Prectol. This is for children. Um, and they gave children uh, opium, laudanum products quite a bit in these patent medicines. And this one has it. And it's cherry flavored for children so that they like it. And so if you have a colicky baby, give it a little opium, a little this fixes them right up. Uh, you know, all kinds of problems. They, by the end of the 19th century, they were calling this the poor man's babysitter. Because uh, if you say you and your wife wanted to go out, but you couldn't afford a babysitter and all that, that's okay. Douse the kids with this. 
They sleep all night. You can leave them alone. You come back in the morning, they're still snoozing. And so they're doctors, some doctors, some reformers are saying, hey, you know, there's a problem with all of this. This one is with Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. These are uh, opium drops uh, that, so if you have a teething baby, you just squirt a little opium in the, this opium tincture into their mouth, no more pain, no more crying baby. So it fixes them right up. And see that, you look at that ad, that baby wants that. They like, that baby likes that. Um, so it's, you know, so we're having this, so it's mass produced. And so these patent medicines are everywhere. And so I'm an archeologist as well, an historian. And so the archeology span uh, that I used to do, I'd find these, our crews would find these patent medicine bottles everywhere. They'd be in businesses and homes and schools and churches, you name it. it so today you go to the nurse's office, you go down to the nurse's office, you maybe they'll give you some aspirin, uh, something like that at the school, that kind of thing. At this time period, they just give you some of this. They give you a little opium and alcohol, fixes you right up, no more pain. So it's, it's very common as part of all of this. That doesn't mean there's a lot of addiction. There is addiction, of course, but most people were not drinking it all the time to become addicted. Some were, uh, so there's different bearings on that. And addiction is really hard to track at this time period. I tried to because what do you mean by addiction? How are you recording it? Are you counting everything? So it's it kind of fuzzy there. All right, this is uh, Hostetter's stomach bitters. This is opium as well. Now bitters uh, are any of these patent medicines that have to do with digestion, uh, anything to do with digestion. And so these were, like it says there, cleanses the blood of every sediment that causes this racking disease. So it clears your blood. This is just opium and alcohol primarily, a few herbs and spices to make it medicinal. These are uh, Frazier's antihistamine heroin tablets. Have a little trouble breathing? Heroin, pop some heroin pills, fix you right up, get you going, does your cough. The, this is Smith Brothers glyco heroin cough drops. Um, and Smith Brothers is a cough drop brand that's still around, but these were made with heroin. So suck on a little heroin cough drop, you know, your cough goes away with, like I said, it deadens the pain. So yeah, you, the irritation, so you don't feel it. Now, People are still smoking it. This is an opium den in San Francisco. So smoking opium is still popular, even though it's commercially in all of these products. And at these opium dens, what you would do is you pay a fee at the door, uh, or once you got in there, they would bring you out a tray with paraphernalia, a couple opiums to choose from, because there are different types of opium, where they come from, their strength. We're not getting into all that. Um, and then you'd smoke it until you kind of, your money ran out, and then they throw you out. You could also mail order it um, through all of the major uh, catalogs and they deliver it right to your door. So you had Sears and Roebuck, JC Penney, Montgomery Wards, and this is laudanum here. Uh, you can't see it, darn it, it's cut off at the bottom. But this is tincture of laudanum and it's a one ounce bottle for 10 cents. Or you can get a little one ounce bottle of laudanum. Um, now you don't drink the whole bottle of laudanum itself because it is poison, but you take a few drops and put in whatever you're drinking, depending on how much you want. Um, but you could order this, you could order morphine, you could order heroin, you could order raw opium. Uh, just to go along with this, you could order uh, marijuana and cocaine, you, you name it, you could order them uh, through the medicine section of these because there are no laws restricting any of these things uh, in the 19th century. So this is another way, right? So it spreads around. So you have imperialism going on, taking over areas to get the trade going. You have commercialization, industrialization of it to mass produce it and sell it all over the world. So it's becoming common. So it's all common. And then that brings us to prohibition, the next stage, because they start deciding, uh, officials do and reformers, there's a whole bunch of reformers saying that opium is causing a problem. Opioids are calling, causing a problem. Something needs to be done about it. Um, and I should look at my time to make sure we're doing it right. Yeah, we're okay. Um, and um, so do something about it. They start pressuring governments to do something about it. And the first real big movement to this is the International Opium Commission in 1909 where they get together and uh, work on looking at, is opium a problem? Problem. What is the opium trade like? Uh, and when I say opium, I mean all of its products too. So um, what should we do? Now, the report that came back from the commission said it's not an issue, uh, mainly because they went to India 
and only India to look at opium. Now the production of opium had moved to China now and India was producing very little. And so they looked around India and said, they don't have an opium problem. There's not that much being produced here. But n none of them ever went to China to look at what was going on in China, which was interesting because there's still a lot of money wrapped up in this. But the reformers started really pushing to change this. And what this goes into is what's called the Anglo-American civilizing mission that ties into it. And this ties to imperialism as well. And it's why it's called the Anglo-American is it's mainly driven by the United States, but also the British reformers as well. And these reformers, these American and British reformers did not mind empire. They did not mind the fact that imperialism was going on and they were exploiting areas around the world. That's just the way it is. That's money coming in. What they started looking at is addiction in these areas and its impact on people because they said that the people around the world that aren't Western are not able to handle opium like white people are. White people can say no and they're strong and they can handle it, but other people in the world, people of color are not. And they, they're primitive, uh, they're uh, backwards, they're weak, they consider them children. Uh, no matter what their age, they're children. And so they have to be protected. And so this whole civilizing mission goes out with a lot of drugs. I mean, they look at alcohol, cocaine, uh, a lot of different things um, as part of this. And so they start saying, we need to ban opium. We need to do this. And they start pushing it forward. However, um, it's very slow to gain traction in most countries. And so the United States is a leader in this, and they become a leader in this prohibition. They want it done, they're pushing for it, and so they decide just to do it on their own for the United States. And in 1914, the United States uh, Congress passes the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. And this is misleading because it says tax act, and what it's doing is taxing opium, uh, opiates, uh, but it's also taxing them to start regulating them and then start banning them and outlawing them. And so what this act leads to is the prohibition of opium, but not all opium. They prohibit recreational and individual use of opiates. There are exemptions in this law that allows pharmaceutical companies still and hospitals to still prescribe and give out legal opium. But if you wanted to go buy it, that's illegal. But if a pharmaceutical company wants to import it into a country and sell it as a medicine, then that's legal. So there a line there that they work on. And so the, that exemption as part of it all, because it's still used as a drug and painkiller, you know, and as a medicine, but they're trying to eliminate this other part of it. All right, so this spreads though, other countries start to spread it. And in April of 1917, China is, uh, ends the opium cell in production and they shut down major production in China. Uh, and so now it's finally illegal in China for real, uh, and other countries do this. And by 1924, there's some 60, uh, 63, I believe, countries that have outlawed to some degree or another opioids. And so they're really cracking down. So it's becoming a global thing uh, by then as part of all of this. Now, World War I and World War II. World War I becomes an issue because at the beginning, 1914, is when you're starting to outlaw uh, opium uh, more so, but you need morphine and heroin, mostly morphine, but heroin too is a battlefield drug. So you start using it more and more, the soldiers do. Uh, this of course creates some uh, opium addicts, but also creates uh, the side market. Now you're creating an illegal market. So you have the legal market from the pharmaceutical companies, but you also have an illegal market uh, being created as well. And so it kind of spread. Then we get into World War II, and a similar thing happens, but there's a whole bunch of uh, new drugs that become big in World War II that we're going to talk about, you know, amphetamines, methamphetamines, they're heavily used during World War II. Uh, but um, they start, the, World War II really disrupts this global illicit market because the war is going on, things shift around, uh, and it's kind of hard to get the legal supplies uh, going, you know, uh, steady, uh, the, even the legal supplies are getting disrupted because of the war. And so there's a lot of changes happening. And so that brings us then to the next stage, 
which is uh, in the last stage I'm gonna talk about is the Cold War and the war on drugs, the development of the war on drugs. And so the thing about the Cold War, uh, fighting communism, the United States and its allies fighting communism around the world, drugs take a central part in this, um, in some of these areas. Um, and so government officials, uh, both American and French government officials, but others as well, um, and military officers and others start dealing in drugs, illegal drugs, uh, or making it easier for people to get them because they find out that this is a great way to promote anti-communism, to fund weapons, to fight against communism and all of this. At the same time they're doing this, in the public mind, they blame the communist powers on the spread of the drugs, which actually, for the most part, is not true. Like Chinese communists, for example, uh, did not like the drug trade. They considered a decadent capitalist uh, trick to destroy them, and so they outlawed all of these things and were very harsh on it. Russia, the Soviet Union would do a little bit later when their economy started suffering, but that would be much later. Uh, but they would be blamed for it. It's a drugs are a communist plot. While uh, English, uh, French, and American officials are set selling or helping sell it, uh, kind of idea at the same time. And a major person in all of this, get his picture up there, is this man. And you, yeah, you can see him here. Uh, Henry J. Anslinger. And so Henry J. Anslinger is appointed uh, in the 1930s as the head of the new Bureau of Narcotics. And so he's in charge of narcotics and the dealing with the illegal drugs. And so he hates drugs, and he does, uh, but he's also even more so anti-communist. He's extremely anti-communist. And so he knows, and he's very aware, documents show that he's very aware that some of our allies and even some of our officials were helping spread illegal drugs, opioids and others. However, he ignored it because you, he felt, we'll deal with that later, we have to get communism first then we'll fight the drugs uh, kind of idea. While at the same time, he said it's a communist plot. So it's always an interesting uh, thing as part of this. And so he really spreads out. And Anslinger is instrumental in getting uh, cannabis, marijuana outlawed in the United States. It, he was a major part of that, just as a sideline. Um, and so what happens after World War II then, in the 1950s, what develops is what's known as the French Connection. Um, and this is a drug pipeline for heroin, primarily heroin, uh, coming uh, across the Middle East. And so they, you, what they do is they start producing and growing the opium in Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey. It's then taken to Turkey, all of it is, and processed into heroin in labs in uh, Turkey. It is then loaded onto French cargo ships and sh sent to Marseille. Uh, with legal shipments. So there are legal opium coming in, legal heroin, legal morphine coming in. Part of the cargo is illegal uh, that they smuggle in with it. Then the French uh, uh, traffickers take this and sell it to American traffickers in New York and Chicago and organized crime gets in this. And I've done an immense amount of work on organized crime as well. And so uh, people like uh, Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano are some of the groundbreaking beginnings of this stuff. They worked with the French Connection. And so then they distribute it to the rest of the United States. So you're getting this illegal, primarily heroin trade rolling then as part of this. All right, then that brings us to Vietnam. So they shut down the French Connection. They figure it out it's there, they start disrupting it. And so it keeps moving around and all that. And then the war in Vietnam really stimulates this global drug trade, illegal drug trade, because that's what we're talking about now is the illicit drug trade. And what happens here is soldiers in Vietnam, uh, so the French first and the French war in Vietnam and the French are losing, French officials start dealing drugs and selling uh, opium and uh, producing opium and heroin in order to help them with the war effort. It doesn't work. They pull out, the United States te steps in. The Un United States military officials and government officials, including operatives of the CIA, uh, start working, uh, selling or making it easier. Because I shouldn't say they sell, they just work with the traffickers to make it easier for them to traffic it. And it's being shipped on military aircraft and so forth. Uh, they start doing this as well. 
uh, in order to fight communism. And Vietnam, what this does is two things. Uh, one is it creates a lot of chaos in the world in the area, so it's easy for this illicit trade to get rolling, right? Because it's launched. But another one is it increases its use in Vietnam, which it wasn't heavily being used in Vietnam before this, but it also uses a scapegoat, the American soldiers there. Um, and so soldiers in Vietnam are under a lot of pressure. Uh, and, and I need to, I'll pick up speed here, we're almost done. Uh, it, they're under a lot of pressure, stress, war, especially once the war starts doing badly. And so marijuana use is quite high in Vietnam. And it's actually, look, people look the other way uh, because they don't use it in combat. They don't use it on guard duty, that kind of idea. It's just to relax. Um, and military officers in Vietnam uh, even say they would rather have their, so, their troops smoking marijuana, smoking pot in camp than drinking. And the United States is providing an immense amount of alcohol to troops in uh, Vietnam. I mean, we're talking cargo ships with tons of alcohol coming in um, to, for the troops. And they decide, well, if the troops are drinking, they can get angry and belligerent and they're well-armed. If they're smoking marijuana, that doesn't happen. Uh, they just kind of sit around. Um, and so they start doing this. But the problem is, is this becomes known to the people back home that American troops are using a lot of um, marijuana. Now in the United States, thanks to Henry J. Enslinger and others, marijuana is considered a horrible drug. In fact, it is as bad as heroin, if not worse than heroin uh, in the United States by this time, by the time you get to the Vietnam War. And so you can go to prison a very long time for being caught with uh, pot. Uh, and so when they see troops using it in Vietnam, they say, fix this, crack down on it. So Congress orders the military, they crack down, they start eradicating uh, marijuana use and arresting people, soldiers for marijuana use. Soldiers are still under stress and pressure and depression and anxiety. Heroin is also around. So they turn to heroin uh, more and more, hard drugs. And heroin is harder to track in the beginning because if you walk by a tent and they're smoking marijuana, you know it, right? Heroin, uh, the way they're doing it, and they're not injecting it because that's too noticeable. They're usually smoking it or drinking it. They mix it with tobacco or they drink it in alcohol. You don't know, it's colorless, it's odorless. You don't notice it uh, kind of idea. And so you start seeing drug use go up uh, in this thing. And so what happens then, and so I'll just show you some images here before I hit. So here's smoking marijuana. Uh, most units had combat shotguns. And so you, got, you don't have pipes. So what you do is you empty the shotgun out. You take a cheap little wooden, uh, usually bamboo type pipe that's kind of a disposable. You put it in the chamber. You uh, put the marijuana in it. You light it. They smoke it like a big pipe on the barrel. And so that, that's a common way to do it. So you're uh, using marijuana, but then they crack down on that. So you then start moving to harder, these harder drugs, and this starts becoming a problem. And soldiers, while there is a drug problem in Vietnam, studies have shown, and scholars of research have shown, that actually it's a their problem, right? You're under the stress. A lot of the returning vets did not turn to heroin when they came home. They turned to alcohol a lot, and then later heroin, uh, but not right away. But they were blamed for a growing demand of heroin in the United States and other drugs. That's not accurate at all because what is the growing demand is that because of the turmoil of Vietnam, you now have a very robust illegal market coming from Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Bur what, Myanmar, what was then Burma, all of these areas, uh, uh, Thailand and so forth, uh, funneling into the United States and into Europe. And so this is where the destabilization is where the big market came from. The soldiers were only a very small part of that, but they, become the scapegoats of bringing it back when it actually got here before they did. Um, and so this then leads this problem to the war on drugs uh, in the 1970s. And so President Richard Nixon is the one that coins the term war on drugs. He is the one that starts it. And so Nixon was extremely worried uh, in the late 60s and early 70s uh, of this 
cool, hip, trendy, psychedelic image of drugs in the United States, that young people were using drugs, and it was cool. Now, most of the drugs they were using was not heroin. Uh, where it's mostly marijuana and uh, hallucinogens uh, and some other things, but heroin is in there. And so he wants to stop this, and so he decides, and he hates drugs. He also hates communism, and he is very vocal about that drugs are a communist plot to weaken America, that it is being brought in to destroy American young people so that communism can take over. Uh, and so he talks about that a lot. So he starts this war on drugs, and he decides he needs a celebrity, a cool celebrity, to appeal to young people to say, don't use drugs. So he asks Elvis Presley. Uh, so he puts Elvis Presley in charge of this campaign, and Elvis Presley is more than happy to do this because he agrees with Nixon, drugs are a problem, it's a communist plot, and actually Presley really wanted a badge, he collected uh, law enforcement badges, uh, he had a whole collection of them uh, that he, they gave him um, from all over the United States, and People have speculated, and, and it's not been 100% proven, but a lot of people have thought that he collected badges, so that way if he's ever caught and they want to search him, he can show one of his law enforcement badges and they let him through with the drugs that he had on him. Um, and because Elvis Presley, in case you did not know this, became a drug addict, uh, a lot of drugs. Uh, they don't even know how many drugs uh, that he did. Because uh, when they did his autopsy, they found, including alcohol, I think 32 different drugs that he, in his system or something like that. So um, a lot of that. So he's put in charge. It doesn't work. The whole campaign falls apart. And this photo was taken here. And the interesting thing about this photo, and Nixon's aides speculated on this, they believed that Presley was high when he met the president. Uh, because they said he was acting strange, he was forgetting things, he would stop mid-sentence and get distracted, uh, he was a little glassy-eyed, uh, and they, they thought, they talked about it in their memos about that they thought he was high, they weren't sure, and Nixon didn't notice, he just thought Presley was re weird because he's a rock and roll star, so that's just the way it works. But he starts this whole war on drugs, and out of this, in 1973, comes the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA is created to fight the war on drugs, not only in the United States, but everywhere in the world, because drugs come from everywhere in the world, it's a foreign problem. And so you have to fight it there. Then real quick, we move on to President Ronald Reagan. Uh, he takes up the war on drugs as well. He talks about it being um, a major, major thing that needs to be done. Of course, he's very anti-communist as well. He talks about, his quote is that it's time to take down the surrender flag and put up the battle flag and really fight a war on drugs. So he hypens it up even more, adds even more into it. And his big uh, law that he pushes to get past his Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. Now, while this drug was mainly focused on cocaine and crack cocaine, it was still, um, uh, dealing with other drugs as well. And just on a side note on the cocaine, uh, Nixon, I mean, Reagan had this huge campaign. Nancy Reagan started her Just Say No campaign. All of that was going on. During his two terms in office, cocaine importation of the United States tripled. Uh, so obviously it wasn't working. And so kind of wrap it up here. And this is where I'm more or less gonna end because as you can see from those statistics that I showed you at the first, the war on drugs has been quite successful. Um, and so, you know, it hasn't worked. And so to understand this, you, you have making these drugs extremely common, spreading them around the world, commercializing them, make, de developing a huge market for them. Then you turned around and said, no, they're now illegal. But you didn't deal with the demand. You didn't deal with the market. It just became an illegal market. And then, of course, you get the pharmaceutical industry in there and overprescription, perhaps, and all, all that, which I'm not going to go into on that. And so that's where I'm going to wrap it up. And I just want to show you um, um, one last thing. Yeah, he appropriated an extra $1.7 billion a year to fund the war on drugs. I forgot about that one. So a lot of money. Um, and so some books, uh, in case you're interested in the history of this, I just wanted to give you some further reading books real quick. And so this one, Narcotic C Culture, A History of Drugs in China, takes a very good look at uh, opium in China, but also tobacco and some other things. But it shows the complexity of the issue about how the Chinese economy and Chinese merchants were very much part of it. It wasn't just the English 
bringing it in. It, it infiltrated everything. And so that's what this one looks at. Um, this one, Opium's Long Shadow, is a real good look at Asian, Asian opium uh, production and trying to control it over this period of the 19th and 20th century. Get them going here. This one, In the Arms of Morpheus, uh, takes a look at morphine, laudanum, patent medicines, and their impact. And it's a really good look at this. This is a book by a colleague of mine at WSU, Dr. A Ashley Wright. Uh, she looks at opium and empire in another area, a Burma, and what was going on in English Burma. And so in case you were not, didn't want to do the Chinese side. Uh, this David Courtright book, David Courtright's written several books on different drugs. And this one is an interesting one, his newest one on the age of addiction. And he looks at, the, if you're interested in the addiction factor, he, this is what he looks at, not just addiction. He looks at addiction to um, uh, drugs, heroin, that kind of thing, but also tobacco, uh, food, a whole bunch of, he looks at a lot of different addictions in this book. Now, uh, Alfred McCoy takes a look at this uh, Cold War politics and drugs or the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia and how these French, English and American officials were involved in this military uh, officers, government officials and others were involved in all this trade. And then in his second book, he really nails down on it and just looks at the CIA's involvement in the spread of drugs and the globalization of drugs. And then of course, um, I have to promote my book um, as well, uh, that takes a look at a lot of what I just talked about, but I also look at alcohol, rum in particular, uh, tobacco, coffee, and cocaine, along with opium uh, and during this period. And I will open it up then for questions. And uh, I also have my email up here. If you want sources, if you wanted me to send you a list of sources on opium, uh, cocaine, hallucinogens, marijuana, whatever, uh, alcohol, tobacco, coffee, uh, shoot me an email and I can send you some uh, suggested books if you want to read up on these topics as part of it all. And so we'll open it for questions then. Any questions? Yes. No, not, not, I mean, huh? Oh yeah, so, so you see uh, dealing with cocaine and crack cocaine that um, the penalties for, basically the penalties for crack cocaine are more severe and the people using crack cocaine tend to be people of color or low income people because powder cocaine is expensive. And so there's a difference there, but the penalties are harsher uh, for the lower end. Uh, and was there a similar pattern in heroin? Uh, not to that degree, because you don't really have heroin divided into that cheaper drug, more expensive drug, even though black tar heroin is a lot cheaper than other heroin. Uh, what you see, though, is you see different groups being blamed uh, for this. So early on, you see the Chinese or Asians being blamed for opium. Uh, then you heroin uh, is... Uh, lower income people uh, or African Americans that are doing it. And of course, cocaine fits into that as well. So you see more of that because you don't really see huge differences between the price of heroin. You know, there's some differentiation, but not to that degree. Yes. Is there a short answer to why Afghanistan is Yes, chaos. Um, I mean, the thing is, is Afghanistan, there's a lot of areas in that opium poppies grow really well. And Afghanistan happens to be one of them. But Turkey, you can grow them in Turkey, India, they grew really well, China, and so forth. The reason is that Afghanistan at first did produce very little opium. It was in India, but India is close to Afghanistan. And so it creeps over. But then when they shut down other markets, then they moved into the mountains of Afghanistan and started growing it and sending it to the Mediterranean. Then when they would crack down on that, then you see Southeast Asian opium boom. Then when you crack down on Southeast Asian opium, Afghanistan and 
that it's, it's called the, the uh, golden triangle and the golden crescent uh, areas. And they went back and forth. And right now it's Afghanistan because you had the turmoil and war. And so you had the Soviet war. Then there was a brief period where it got cracked down on a bit, but then more chaos, more war. If you have the, it's like Vietnam. If you have this destabilization, it's much easier to produce it, ship it out. There's more corruption. It's easier to bribe people. You know, all of these kinds of things are part of it. Others? Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know who is first. <laughs> Yes. It really just wasn't understood in those terms mm -hmm. or phrased. Um, were overdose deaths documented? Did they mm -hmm. consume too much? And did it happen very often? Uh, yes, to a degree. I mean, they did document overdose deaths that they would say, okay, they, they consumed too much and it killed them. So they recognized that. Other times, overdose deaths were a little hazy. Uh, because people would be found dead. The paraphernalia was there. They're like, did it kill them or not? And, and actually there is a, a very famous English uh, court case where a um, man was, uh, a doctor was prescribing him a lot of uh, opioids. Uh, and so he was getting a lot and he died from it, uh, of opium addiction, he overdosed and died. And so um, his um, family and it sued the doctor to say that he, because he kept giving him so much is what did it. And it was a huge court case and they came back uh, and the decision was, we just don't know. They said, it could have been, but he was old and in ill health, it could have been something else. We really don't know. And, they, and so the case didn't go anywhere. And so that's what it was a lot is that some could be attributed to it, but others were hazy. Um, and so, you know, and, and addiction, like I said, was hazy because what do you mean by addiction? How do you do that? If you're a reformer wanting to outlaw opium, the numbers go way up, right? If you're a merchant selling opium, the num you're saying, oh no, no, they're way down here. There is no addiction. And so, yeah, it, it's hard to track. And I, I've spent a little time doing it, and others like David Courtright has spent a lot of time trying to track it, and it, it gets fuzzy. So, and did you have another question? And I'll jump. Yes. <laughs> All right, so cocaine, cocaine, another topic. So did Coca-Cola have cocaine in it? Yes, Coca-Cola, that's why it has its name, uh, Coca. It was guaranteed to have coca leaves in every bottle. Uh, now, that doesn't mean exactly cocaine because cocaine comes from the, even though Coca-Cola did kind of increase the amount to get it more popular uh, as a revitalizing drink. Um, and so, um, and then eventually, and actually Coca-Cola still has coca leaves in it. Uh, Coca-Cola is one of these exemptions. They can import tons of coca leaves. They decocaine the coca leaves, sell the cocaine to pharmaceutical companies and put the coca leaves in as flavoring in Coca-Cola. So it's still flavored with it. Um, and actually the founder of Coca-Cola was a um, heroin addict. Uh, who started using cocaine to cure his heroin addiction, because that was also what cocaine was touted for. Uh, he attempted to sell it as a medicine when he started Coca-Cola, uh, but then they started taxing medicines. Uh, so he then called it a, uh, he tried it as a coca wine. He mixed it with wine and you were gonna drink, but then Georgia outlawed alcohol. And so then he started calling it a soft drink and took the alcohol out and called it a, a soda. And so it, it, yeah, so there's a whole story there, but anyway. And back here. Yeah, I have a question about um, gender and opiates. Yes. Um, in the 1950s, you see examples of soldiers, both men, mm -hmm. Primary 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you see a change in the 19th century in the West, in, in so Western Europe, the United States, it was mostly women that used opium, opioids. Uh, in fact, uh, it's estimated that about three quarters of opium users uh, were women uh, in the 19th century, in the, like the United States is the estimate. China's the opposite. China, it's probably close to three quarters men uh, because of that sexual thing uh, that goes with it. Um, so yes, it, it was heavily prescribed to women for all kinds of conditions. It also fits with the gender, the Victorian gender roles of the period. And I could go off for days, ask my wife on the Victorians. Uh, but um, it basically, the Victorian system in the United States and in England was a very oppressive system for women. It was very patriarchal. Women were very confined. And so if a woman did not want to conform, she was given opium, uh, that was opium opioids to control her. If she, she went to sanatoriums, uh, they were, she was given opium. Uh, or she could use opium because proper women in the 19th century Victorians could not drink alcohol in public, but they could take their medicine, patent medicines. They could drink laudanum, and that was perfectly all right. So you tend to see more women. Now, once it becomes outlawed, uh, there is a shift happening that then it's a more medicine for battlefield soldiers and you see it, men going other places in the war. So women are still using it, but it shifts to more men as you move through the 20th century. So 19th century, heavily women. Then early 20th century, it's starting to even out. And then, you know, after World War II, it's more men. But women today, I mean, I don't know what, I have to look. I don't know the statistics today about addiction and users, but so in the very back. You mentioned the, uh, excuse me, the fuzziness and the haziness behind overdosing back then. The question kind of pertains to overdosing now. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the question was um, that overdose deaths um, in the 19th century, early 20th century, were kind of fuzzy because uh, it was hard to get good data on that. Uh, is that same thing going on today that deaths are being attributed to the wrong thing is inflated? You know, I really can't answer that question uh, accurately because I haven't studied the modern period that much on this. I mean, we do have better ways to track it. it overdose is easy, more easily recognized. Uh, you can do tests to find out how much drugs are in a person's system. You know, so there's a lot more scientific uh, techniques to determine it that they didn't have in the 19th century. Because if someone died of an overdose in the 19th century, they just looked at them and said, well, they're dead, what killed them? Oh, look, there's a syringe nearby, maybe that was it, you know, because you don't know. Now you can actually do the tests. Uh, but, but I really, I just don't have enough information to accurately answer that question. So, so yeah, uh, follow up? Yes, yeah, so follow up. Mm -hmm. A lot of research recently has shown that is known to actually very rarely cause overdoses. It's very hard to mm -hmm. overdose on opium. On opium itself, it's harder, yes. yes. Like yeah. Opium is very mm -hmm. hard. Um, a lot of people that are dying of overdose deaths in America right now on opium often do with painful supplements, painful drugs, mm -hmm. or a misappropriation of amounts of drugs mm -hmm. that you're getting, Pepsi, right, that's all. Um, one of the other large contributing factors recently that I've been reading about some of these overdose deaths, especially when somebody's been dying in the hospital, who's liver failure, which can contribute to the opioid being processed through the liver when in fact mm -hmm. opium is processed through the whole bladder, where paracetamol mm -hmm. is the main component that are killing a lot of these opioid addicts. Mm -hmm. So these people that are addicted to opium but are taking large amounts of paracetamol with their prescribed medication or street medication. Mm -hmm. um, there's a large argument and conversation we have right now is that paracetamol is actually killing the 
these near 100,000 people that you mentioned, mm -hmm. not the actual ocean. Right, and, and, and the difference you got to look at is that heroin is much more addictive than opium and it, it is easier to overdose on. Uh, you know, so morphine's in the middle than heroin. So you got to take that into fact. And I, I've, you know, like I said, you're outside my realm <laughs> getting into that. But I do know that uh, the smoking of opium, just using pure opium itself, not morphine, not heroin, uh, it is not as addictive as the other two. And sometimes like in China, uh, a lot of people smoke the opium, didn't have as high addiction rates as the government would put out. There's evidence of that. That one book I gave you on drugs in China points that out. Um, and it's much harder to die of a pure smoke, you know, opium overdose. But of course, as you move up to morphine, heroin, and those, then it gets worse. And then of course, we have a lot of the synthetics that go in there, especially with fentanyl, uh, that's causing all kinds of issues because that, you know, the synthetic one. So yeah, the stronger it is, the more chance you have to overdose if you get too much at once kind of idea. Um, but all of the other, you said that's well, way outside my realm. I'm a historian. I, you know, that that's I can't handle that one. So, uh huh. Okay. Yeah, so so basically the kind of if I get the gist of what you're saying, that the, the political system of measuring all of this uh, is is skewed or, or not as accurate. Is that what you're yes. yeah. Yeah. Well the problem seems to go down. It just depends on the drug and other thing, because I mean the, the thing about it and why the war on drugs, in my opinion, has been a failure, and, and I have a lot of other scholars that back me up on this, is that you go out, you arrest people who are selling drugs, you arrest people who are using drugs, you fill up the prisons with all of them, you're going to end the drug problem. No, because they're replaced by more. Number one, there's a lot of money to be made here. So you're always going to be finding people to sell these illegal drugs uh, on that end because there's money to be made. And since there's so much money to be made, you want to find more users. And so if you, you can't lock up all the people using illegal drugs because as soon as you lock up 100, 100 new ones are going to start using it because the ones selling it want them to use it because that's what's going to make them the money. <laughs> So, you know, it's that kind of idea. So this is why, because the war on drugs is based on this idea that if you arrest enough people, you throw enough money at it, you're going to solve the problem. But it's not obviously solving the issue. The drug use is continuing to climb. Um, illegal drug supplies are growing uh, and have been growing for years. They've, they've been holding pretty steady the last uh, four years, four or five years at the numbers I gave you. Uh, there's been slight changes, but not much. Um, and so the, and maybe that's the capacity right now, with, but that's also with people being arrested and trying to prevent addiction and all these things that are part of it as well. So uh, I think, so yeah, just ignoring it while it's illegal. I mean, my, my premise, and this is just me, uh, is that we need to start treating drug use as an addiction issue, uh, dealing it as a health issue. It's a health issue. It's not a criminal issue. We've been treating it like a criminal issue and it hasn't been working. We need to treat it as like a health issue. 
Uh, and some countries are doing that. And some European countries have been doing that and they've been fairly successful uh, at reducing uh, these kind of things and addiction rates and all that. And so we need to start, we need to change how we look at it in my opinion. But that, you know, that's just my opinion. I'm not the only one that believes that, but you know, just arresting drug users isn't, hasn't worked. It hasn't worked for the last, you know, almost hundred years. Um, and so uh, you know, we have to do something different uh, as part of that. But then there you got the whole realm of, like I said, the pharmaceutical industry and mass production of drugs that are still out there. And you know, that, like I said, outside my realm. So, all right, we good? So, yeah. Thank you again to everybody who came out this evening for our presentation. Um, thanks so much to Dr. Fonts. Uh, if you are enjoying this program series, I hope that you will uh, join us again in February, February 17th, same time, same place, including on Zoom. And our guest speaker will be Dr. Jesse Sponholtz, and he'll be talking about refugees, another uh, very pressing issue in our global community. So thank you again, everybody um, stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, we appreciate having you here this evening. Oh, yes. <laughs> sorry, it didn't work. That's I don't right. know if maybe it was like